Gondra International once again presents the Remarkable Women Powerful Stories series. And I welcome you to my conversation today with Tulile Kanile. I'm Lynn Foley and I'm truly privileged to speak with the remarkable women who are absolutely generous with their stories and their time. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also pay the respects to any First Nations people present. Sondra International is a leading global organisation and we work together to build a better world for women and girls. So Talile, I, I warmly welcome you to our conversation today uh, and thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you so much for having me, Lynn. I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. So I'm just going to give the audience a very short explanation of, of some of your achievements and who you are, but most of who you are and what you've done will be um, will come to fruition as we have our conversation. One of the things I noticed um, in your bio is that your goal is to show African youth that the face and future of science and technology is us. And as a vibrant award-winning scientist and social entrepreneur and the co-founder and co-director of Nika Kuto, Edu Propeller NPO and the Techno Propeller Proprietary Limited. You're a keynote speaker and you facilitate lots of panel conversations. You blog, you podcast, and you express and bring science to the public with the name of normalizing, especially technology and innovation as an economic driver. I also know that you're very passionate about science and your study and your work has been in the field of science and continues to be. And you believe that the key to economic freedom in our lifetime is emancipating through education, previously disadvantaged communities residing in all spheres of society. You've had many, many awards in the academic mm -hmm. space and for your work around your country in South Africa. And you're very highly qualified with your master's degree in science in medicine from the Whit Waters Rand uh, University, um, sorry, Institute of Technology. So, or the university, I should say, of Whitwaters Rand. I'm sorry, I've got that wrong. So, with that in mind, let's get going with our conversation. <laughs> I know that you were born and raised in Durban, and you now live and work in Johannesburg. I'm keen to hear about where your story began and how your upbringing has influenced the woman you are today. Sure. So um, my upbringing is uh, somewhat of a, a I, I guess, a, a traditional one, right? It's a, it's a family with a mom and a dad and, and just my brother um, mm -hmm. going to school like regular kids, I guess, and uh, playing sports and getting leadership roles at school, even from primary school to high school. Um, and just doing well in um, doing as, as well as I could, I guess, um, in uh, my studies, but also just really engaged in cultural activities uh, within within the school. So sports, I was there, I was on the field, I was on the debating, I was on, you know, writing poetry. So I, I was that um, young person that was very um, um, excited to just live, I guess, you know, and I think mm -hmm. it's a function of having support. Um, from my parents and perhaps to a large extent also having um, the, the the resources or the, or the capability to do that from my parents who are um, uh, civic society employees or government employees as a teacher, mm. uh, as a policeman, uh, my mom. Mm. So I think really I've accumulated through my upbringing a lot of skills that I actually didn't know I would need into the future. Um, so by being on the field or having speaking opportunities as a, as a kid and having leadership roles as a kid, I mean, you just don't know that that's actually building your muscle for leading, speaking and advocating mm -hmm. and all of the other things that I do now. It's, it's, it's very interesting. And I, I think you said you're um, quite um, a lot of generations in your family have had that further study in university, which we'll explore in a moment. I'm really interested. I remember you told me a story uh, with your teacher mom and your policeman dad and your family being that place of great conversation and debate. Um, I know there was a story there about um, what your dad expected you to do. Often when you were a teenager, you might like to share. But I'm also interested in how your upbringing has contributed to that development of your powerful voice. And you are a big voice for your generation in your own mm -hmm. country. 
if not further. So I'll leave that with you to choose what story yeah, so, you tell. Um, I don't remember which one we, we spoke about previously, but there's so many of these stories, especially with my dad, um, because I think the, the, the idea with him is that, with especially my dad, is that you, 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 you need to know why you're doing what you're doing. You need to know why you're making the choices you're making. Um, and to do that, you need to be, you need to have, you need to be able to express yourself and express yourself well, right? So mm -hmm. there is usually quite a lot of debate to date at home about pretty much anything. It could be current affairs. It could be, should we have this president or should we not have that president? Um, it should be, but also just taking accountability for the things that you do, right? So mm -hmm. when I had to go to high school, my parents were like, oh, so which high school would you want to go to? And I was like, oh. So I must select, I must choose. And they're like, yeah, well, it's your future. It's not ours. We all have high school degrees. We have high school qualifications. Mm -hmm. And when I found the school, then my dad said, oh, okay. So what do you need to get in? I said, oh, okay, I'll go find out. And then I came back and said, well, you have to write an application letter with a motivational letter. And then he said, okay, write it. And I wrote <laughs> it and I was 12. Um, mm -hmm. And I got into the school, which was really, which was really great, you know? But it's this idea behind knowing and being able to to develop a language for what you want to say and what you want to do and be able to convince the next person you always had to convince my dad even if you wanted a skirt why this one and why not that one and then you have to say oh my word. okay so this skirt is also going to go with those shoes but it's also going to go with that top and I can wear it at church but I can also wear it here and I can also wear it there it's versatile so you always had to have a reason for why things things are happening. Um, my mom's very academic, um, very academic woman. Um, I mean, she she has a, a master's in education. Um, and I mean, her aunt that raised her, who is my grandmother essentially, because that's who raised my mom, um, also is quite um, quite educated, has had postgraduate degrees as well. Um, but her mother and her aunts as well um, uh, were nurses and had nursing degrees and teaching mm -hmm. degrees. And their fathers had were theologians, so had theology degrees. So I'm about mm -hmm. fourth generation graduate uh, on my maternal side. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, it almost lends itself to what I, I do from a teaching perspective now, uh, almost positioning itself as a calling and a purpose and something I really just can't run away from. <laughs> yes, it's a bit hard to do that when... A, you've got generations of um, family who've been educated in the tertiary sector, but also have been in those service areas like teaching and, and the police and uh, nursing. They're all about giving service, aren't they? And supporting and doing interesting mm -hmm. things. So with that education being so highly valued, how did you choose your path originally into biotechnology and, and now into the scientific research? What, what propelled you to go there? I mean, I, I think because of my marks, I um, wanted to, I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. All right. I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. And unfortunately, I didn't get into medicine. <gasps> unfortunately, okay. at the time, um, but uh, really fortunate now uh, because then I had to, I, I still, I went into university wanting to get into medicine. So I would have done a life sciences degree mm -hmm. so that I can at some point maybe finish that degree and go into medicine. But what doing a life sciences degree did or biotechnology, what it did was teach me the back end of medicine, um, which is something that I think uh, from a career guidance perspective is not really clear when you're growing up um yeah. and you're, you're going to school it's just like okay you're going to be a doctor you're going to be an engineer you're going to be an accountant mm -hmm. you know the nuances of the different fields are not fully explored um mm -hmm. uh, mostly also because teachers just don't know that those those careers exist most of the time so but as soon as you as soon as I got into university um I was exposed to much more and I, I understood that doctors are the actors we see on the screen but the directors and the producers and the writers of the movie are actually uh, the ones who yep. hold more power. But because yep. you're the actor or the actress, perhaps you hold more influence. So, yep. or visibility, you know. So then I was in the back end of um, in the back end of biotechnology, um, and when I needed to um, graduate to graduate for my first uh, qualification, I needed 
to do experiential learning or in-service training for, for a year. So you had to go into industry. Um, and I was so certain about where I wanted to go. Um, I wanted to go to the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research to do it. And when I didn't find an avenue to get in, I took a year, went to audition, did musical theater for that year um, until an opportunity presented itself for me to get into the CSIR, um, where I then was exposed to HIV research and fell in love with HIV research um, out of the proximity of the pro problem to my life, because a lot of people in my family had HIV and a lot of them had died because of HIV. So mm -hmm. I felt there was a proximity there. Um, and I think, you know, being at the CSIR, uh, you, you know, sort of uh, laid the foundation for the kind of research I would um, do and I would get into. And then I would do my fourth mm -hmm. year degree and then I'd do my master's as well, also at the CSIR, still looking at, at, at HIV um, mm -hmm. now within uh, molecular medicine and hematology at VITS. And so now you've extended that into your PhD candidate, aren't you? At, yeah, at yeah, university. sure. Mm. Yeah, sure. So, so I mean, the first, um, the first research project I worked on, uh, I'd say, was screening um, plants for the active ingredient um, that would otherwise neutralize HIV. Um, and then I went on to using in my master's, looking at or exploring laser technology as a function of delivery, as a delivery mechanism for antiretroviral drugs or any other drug that is difficult to, to, to reach. Um, and now looking at more immunology or more virology and trying to see or investigate a variety of DNA-based strategies to develop a vaccine against HIV. So it's still very much mm -hmm. HIV, but um, you know, um, lead agents at the beginning or uh, drug development or drug creation and production at the beginning and testing of those drugs and then drug delivery and now more uh, immunology, virology in the vaccine sector. It's incredibly interesting. So as an aside question, in, um, in your country in South Africa, um, is it safe for me to assume that HIV is still one of the big um, illnesses or diseases that's affecting some of the population oh for sure i mean we're we're a leader in the world where hiv is concerned um our infections are ridiculously high um i think we account uh we are quite account for majority of the infections of hiv in the world i think mm. alongside Botswana, if i'm not mistaken Yes, uh, I know Papua New Guinea, just north of Australia, also has has had and may still have a fairly high rate as well. But so there's so much work needed, obviously, to move um, your country to a point where that infection rate reduces. Mm, absolutely, absolutely, and I think that's why it's so important to to have a vaccine, uh, primarily. Mm. But also, it's why it's why issues of economy matter because when the country is is in economic uh, when society doesn't have means of of, of making money and living um you know young people tend to depend on older people so young girls will date significantly older men because they're going to be taken care of and that's really the cycle that perpetuates the um yes. new infections especially amongst yes. young people young girls on a yearly basis and then these boys grow up because they didn't get attention from the girls when they were younger because the girls were dating older guys and then when they're working then they go back to the younger girls and they infect them so it's just it's that kind of a a, a cycle that really lends itself to um social ills to be to to be honest yes. yeah and it's a it's a, a very um vicious cycle isn't it that it seems almost impenetrable to to make mm. make a difference so yeah. Along the way, you've had so far, and I'm sure it's not the end of them, those academic awards and bursaries and, and because of your work, I'm wondering how that's um, assisted you. How has that assisted you in your study and your work? Because there's quite a long list of those awards in your bio. I mean, tremendously. I mean, um, it's essentially, un unfortunately, to do postgraduate studies, um you 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 get old as you're doing them and your peers from other industries start working 
so there has to be some kind of an incentive to to keep me doing this work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but also mm-hmm. it's to the benefit of of, of the country because you you want to have young people who are leading in a variety of sectors. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate because I could um, apply. You know, I I think also. I mean, timing is so important. I mean, Malcolm Gladwell speaks about uh, mm. the the timing of things. You know, yes. and, I mean, there's there's going to be a time in South Africa where there's going to be a bunch of retired uh, 60, 65, 70 year olds, old black women who have mm. PhDs in the sciences, and that's mm. going to be because when we got into the sciences, it was alongside the tremendous efforts that were being made into the country to advance women in the sector. So there were a lot of opportunities targeted at at, at young women um, at the time. So I could be in a position to apply for those uh, positions. I mean, even for for those uh, scholarships and for those bursaries. Um, Mm -hmm. I do think passing, you know, passing a previous degree also helped quite a lot. But I mean, I think that (laughs) probably helped me quite a lot. And, and, And I think what what I was able to do perhaps which a lot of young people perhaps didn't do who were also getting scholarships in the sector was to look at how how they can use the opportunities that were coming up to position themselves as different to the next which is why my master's um, I decided to do in biophotonics as opposed to just the traditional uh, biotechnology uh, field it's why I wanted to go into a multidisciplinary setting because the time that um, at the time, the, the the opportunities were there for me to explore a little bit more and get out of my comfort and do something that would otherwise challenge me a little bit, but be able to give me uh, the other opportunities to go and present overseas because there wasn't a person like me at the time who had a biology background, who was my age, studying in South Africa, but also mm-hmm. doing um, photonics-based work. So mm-hmm. if I submitted an abstract for a conference, an international conference, I would mm. get it. And if I, mm. I I did get the abstracts to go and present an oral presentation mm. in Hawaii, which is where my first oral convers- uh, uh, presentation was, mm. um, because of being from, from Africa and being woman and being young, I can apply for a scholarship and I'm likely to get it, you know, because mm. I am different. So Mm -hmm. I I was very strategic around the accumulation of um, uh, of these orals and uh, international platforms, Mm -hmm. um, which then meant that I had a little bit more um, than my peers at master's level at the time. So if I did apply for or if I was nominated for something, chances are because of the positioning where opportunity is concerned, I'd be one of those people who could get it. Not always because I was the best, but more so because of how I positioned myself. Yeah, and that's incredibly important, isn't it? Being smart about positioning and and to get what you want and to effectively ask for that. Let's move across to the other part of your life that you're very passionate about. And I know you're passionate, gifted in singing, dancing, art, musical theatre, that whole creative space. Can you share with us some stories of that? And um, how you've engaged in that and 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 how it sustains you. Look, I mean, I think, um, you know, and I always say to, to people and they don't believe this, and I always say, you know, I'm an artist first. I'm a creative first. Um, I'm a writer um, first. And I mean, it was really cool because I, I wrote poems in um, high school um, and those poems are still being recited by, <laughs> you know, because they're in previous yearbooks, so they're still being mm-hmm. recited. I did musical mm-hmm. theatre, even in, in, in even in high school, I was part of mm-hmm. uh, two different musicals uh, while mm-hmm. playing netball uh, and and while doing the writing, you know. Mm-hmm. So when um, when I could, I said to myself, you know what. I'm going to, and I, you know, I did so so many different things. I mean, when hip hop, as a university student, hip hop was on the rise, and yes. a lot of hip hop uh, singers or, or a lot of rappers would want a backup singer. So I found myself backing for a couple of people. Uh, <laughs> so it's a really fun, um, you know. Uh, but also, I mean, when um, there's 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 a dance contest, uh, you know, I'm happy to mm. to participate, you know, and what that has done is that because I work 
now also with young people in my organization, it makes me so relatable. It makes them mm. relate to me. I mean, my love for music means that I can talk to them about things that other people who are older mm. wouldn't want to talk to them about uh, because I have mm. a wider interest in those things. Mm. Um, the creativity helps. I mean, it's just, it, it, I would have never thought that as a scientist, I'd have to do so many presentations um, mm. and create from a visual perspective and design you know so uh, my artistic eye helps me a lot with that um, but also I'm just able to um, I see I see things I think a little differently to my colleagues who are in the same industry as me as technical industries mm. so I will podcast you know mm. and I will podcast as a function of communicating stories of other scientists, you know, but it's an it's a creative ability to be able to podcast and run a conversation or mm. run a panel discussion. Um, but that yes. also comes because of, of, of the huge creativity uh aspect. Um, but also my art hangs on my walls in my house. So that's also cool. <laughs> <laughs> but also a uh, science is creative. I think sometimes we don't link the two, do we? We don't think, oh, scientists are creative, are creative yeah. at heart in their own way because of the work you're doing and the research you do and what you're seeking to develop is is the same as writing a piece of music or writing a song it's just in a different medium that's what I think anyway and I'm not sure if you feel the same so maybe they go together just like this for you that your artistic mm. side and your scientific side just mesh so terribly well makes sense. yeah can, makes sense. <laughs> can I move you into that space now about the young people I know you talk a lot in your um, websites and in all of um, the places that we can find you on the internet that, that you want to make a difference by embracing the demand for change and also to emancipate young people that, as I mentioned earlier, and give them power to move out of destitution and poverty. And I know your organisation, Nakatuto Edu Propeller, is one of the mediums that you are using to engage young people. Can you talk to us about how that happens um, to empower those young people to be independent thinkers and leaders through STEM and the project management space because what you're doing um, to me appears to be incredibly powerful. So thank tell you. Us more thank about you. That. Um, so when I was doing my masters, um, my cubicle mate, Tandegam Tlanga, um her and I I think at the time we maybe we didn't know but we just were in sync but we thought it was ugh, we just get along but I think it was an alignment of value system um mm -hmm. and I think what we um encountered at the time was that we were doing these master's degrees and we we're developing this intellectual property so that we can go to conferences which is great and speak to other scientists mm -hmm. who do the kind of work we do um, and we can also, you can publish and you can be a great researcher because yeah. you're publishing and you, you know, publish for people that are in your sector again. Yeah. So your audience is always these people, but you are working on solutions that really can change the world or change society or contribute to solving really major problems that people are having. But the curriculum doesn't ex exactly introduce us to, as scientists in any case, doesn't really introduce us to what is the route to getting something on to the market. Or maybe let me not call mm -hmm. it market because then it sounds like it's a it's for economic benefit, but really mm -hmm. how do we get the solutions that we do research on to the people that need it? How do I get the vaccine to the people that require the vaccine who are perhaps more uh, prone to getting um, HIV? Uh, and you look at your research and you say, but no one's asking me how, whether or not people want a vaccine, whether or not they want a vaccine of this nature, but I have the skill that is research methods that teaches me and gives me a process for being able to first of all, identify a problem um, and then want to understand the problem and the reason why there isn't a solution and to understand where people are working on solutions, what they're working on and what are the bottlenecks in what they're working on um, that will then enable you to develop some kind of a concept or solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. 
I'm like, well, this mm-hmm. is a powerful concept, especially when you live in a society that has so many challenges, but people are not exposed to this research methodology process that is apparently reserved for postgraduate students. <laughs> and we said, well, what we're going to do is take this process of research methodology and take it right down to um We're going to take it right down to high school level, so 13 to 18, 19 year olds in the country, uh, because it's a formalized structure, we can access them fairly easily, but what we're going to do is go to the most remote areas, because we believe that the most remote areas are where there are problems that some of us are never going to be exposed to. So then we created this program. And as we were growing as well, we got exposed to things like design thinking, the business model canvas um, and the lean startup model. And we sort of created now a, a, a process that merges all of these uh, frameworks in a way that is suitable for the rural communities and the township communities where our beneficiaries and young people reside. Then we teach them this through this process, we teach them the, the research methods, <laughs> then they have to use that to identify problems and conceptualize technology-based solutions. And then we assist them with resources um, so that the idea can be fueled. We give them some mentorship. We mm-hmm. give them um, you know, um, pretty much what they need and what we can provide alongside our partners and mm-hmm. funders mm-hmm. And, and collaborators uh, to assist them to get to that point. And then when they have the technology solution, then we say, then we ask the question, so what? Now what mm-hmm. must happen that you think that this beautiful algorithm is going to solve the challenge of whatever? Then how do you get it to the people? What should it look like? Who's going to prototype it? Who, mm-hmm. you know, so that's really the essence of um, the program that we run. Mm. So it seems to me that this work and your study has is what has, um, I guess, taken you in to be a goalkeeper in the Gates Foundation, perhaps. And that is a community of change makers and it's about advancing the sustainable development goals in different ways. So can you talk to us about that inspiration? Like you, it appears you're reimagining and you're working to a better future. So um, how did it come about that you became a goalkeeper and how does that link together with the rest of your work? Yeah, so, you know, I, I got an email and it's, it's, so, it's so funny because um, now we have like a, in the organization, we have a, a lovely team of young people. There's about seven, eight of us now um, that work uh, within the organization. And, mm-hmm. and that day, and I'm not, I'm not too operational anymore. Um, uh, so I, uh, there are certain events that are like critical for me to go to, but not, not, not all of them. And this, this time, I don't know why I decided I was going to attend a research workshop uh, in one of the provinces. Um, and as this was happening, I'm checking my emails and an email comes in from the Gaze Foundation. And I'm like, what? Are they sure? What What is going <laughs> on? You know? Um, and for quite a while, I, uh, I I mean, I understood that it's a nomination based. Um, it's a nomination based, um, um, you know, entry. Um, and I understand I understood at the time that it was a community of people that were working towards uh, reaching the sustainable development goals. So it would have been someone who would have seen the work that I do that mm-hmm. would have said, well, this person should be um, amongst like-minded individuals so they can mm-hmm. network and find ways to advance this work. Mm-hmm. Um, and also just, you know, for best practice, I mean, I, I think we underestimate underestimate best practice so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also underestimate community quite a lot because some of the things that we do um, to sort of drive some change in society can get a little bit lonely because um, building an organization isn't an easy thing to do. It's really difficult to run an organization and build an organization. So the Gates Foundation does build that uh, um, that that community that enables you to to you know to have people who are like minded and uh, people that can can have perhaps had some of the challenges that you have um, and are able to. Um, assist you but also to collaborate you know and uh, Mm. also gain visibility for the work that you do so that you're able to advance it so that that Mm. has um but also just you know there's a there's a credibility to being recognized by the gates foundation Mm. that Mm. enables you to um speak a little bit differently if you want Mm. a kind of attention Mm. you know but it also Uh, 
does it also give you that platform to have to even um, empower your voice further? Like you have a powerful voice in your own communities, in your own country, in your own field, but it seems that this is a platform to broaden the reach that you have, perhaps? Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, for a long time, I think um, we just thought we were doing, um, you know, we thought we were doing work with young people to give them skills, et cetera, et cetera. And then after a while, we realized that, no, this is actually advocacy. We're advocating mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a different way of looking at education. And if we're going to advocate, we need our voices to be amplified. And that is true. The Gates mm -hmm. Foundation does that very well to amplify the voices of um, uh, um, goalkeepers. So it does, mm -hmm. it has really impacted the work quite a lot. Um, and of course, we we are challenging um, the education system and we want it to be better quality and we want it to not only focus on content, but to focus on building quality individuals that are able to um, advocate for themselves, speak for themselves, lead themselves, lead others, you know, um, have the confidence to, to, to move, to move around beyond the spaces that they're in. Um, so, so SDG four for us is really important. Um, and through the, through the different projects that we work on or the different technologies that these young people uh, develop. Uh, you know, it could be young people developing um, solutions for, for energy, energy solutions um, mm. and um, issues around agriculture, smart ways of farming. Um, and uh, that then allows us to branch into other SDGs. Mm. Uh, mm. Other Absolutely. SDGs. You know what I mean? And, and, and of course yeah. we work with a lot of people. So, yeah. So keeping with the SDGs, of course, there's one there. I think it's number five. I didn't check it before I started to talk to you about gender and the future path to gender equity. And every time I talk to women of all ages in all organisations, um, we, particularly in my age group, we continue to be disappointed about what we see as the lack of progress. And if you look at the World Economic Forum information, you're looking at 100 plus years before across the entire world, we get anywhere close to it. I'm wondering what your views are about um, what we have to do, what, the, what as individuals we can do, but what uh, countries have to do to really move uh, closer to getting the voice and the skills and the intellect of women, and of course, people from diverse cultural backgrounds as well, onto those decision-making tables. So what are your views and what do you think from your perspective, has to happen? You know, um, so the discrimination or at least the marginalization of, of women and girls um, primarily exists today because it was systemic, right? It was a direct thing to say, women can't do this and women can do this. And so over the years, I believe what, what then happens is women themselves begin to be believe and perpetuate the narrative that that's a space for women and that's a space for men. Mm -hmm. And as women, we tend to believe this. Mm -hmm. And I think without knowing it, it, it um, sort of perpetuates within us a inferior sort of position, a I need to wait to be told, a uh, I need to get permission for, I shouldn't speak because, you know, so it, it's a lot of, 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 of that that now prevents um, us as women from even wanting to take on certain spaces, even when the opportunities are there. And we can't challenge because I can't speak loudly because if I do, then I'm going to be aggressive and I can't, you know, mm -hmm. so there's quite a lot. So even when you are in the space and you're the only woman in the mm -hmm. room you are the one that's lifting up or, or, or making sure that you're taking notes and making people coffee and doing this. I do none of that. Absolutely mm -hmm. never do any of that, uh, particularly because even in those rooms, we're still advocating. But here's what I want to, what I often think about is how, how we need to stop giving permission to women and girls to do anything and how we can achieve that so that for them, as they grow up, it becomes taboo that there are certain things that they are expected to do or not do. So innately, I want a 13 year old to say, that doesn't even make any sense. I'm not gonna do that. Because mm -hmm. 
but they, in their own rights, they don't understand why they have to succumb to that because they've yeah. never had. So the, the important thing about, um, or the important thing we do, I think in, in our program, besides the contents that we deliver and besides the, the beautiful technology solutions that these kids come up with, I think the main thing that we do is to get them to a point where they can choose, they can hope, they can dream, they mm -hmm. can speak. So when something happens, we see it at our university uh, students now, which are our alumni, we see we have the most, what would what society would call feisty girls, but what we call yes. girls that just know exactly what they want and are able to articulate that. Because why shouldn't you be able to do that? It's not a function of gender. It's a, it's a function of, I don't agree, I agree. So then I have to say that I agree and I don't agree. So the gender function has been applied to so many things that have nothing to do with gender because of our history. And if we're running programs, I think we must run programs where head to head, we make our boys and our girls go head to head. And we already know that girls are being given a little bit more tasks at home. So we know that girls have an advantage. So when we equalize the playing field, the girls are always going to go on top because they are forced when they're at home and when they're in society to do more than boys. So they are forced going... To get... Yeah. So I'm sorry I interrupted you. I didn't mean to, but it's to do more to get to the same place as men. So oh, it's, yes. it's, it's inequitable. So we talk about equality, but we're actually, mm -hmm. what we, you and I are talking about is equity. How, mm -hmm. how do they have that equitable position so that they start on the same starting blocks. And it's it's something that I mean, the Zonta organization is at the core and the heart of what we do is that building that better world. And we're working really hard. And I agree with you. I was recently in a meeting where there were two, I'm on a board and I think there were three women in the room and a number of men. And it came time, something had to happen about note taking or whatever. And all three of us said, it's not women's work. We just automatically, we hadn't even talked about it. All three of us just said, that's not women's work. And and the men looked at us and um, we didn't take the note. Yeah. <laughs> we almost have to <laughs> always take on like a, a defensive tone sometimes. And you're just like, no, I'm not going to do that, actually. That's no, not my job today. It's your turn. I'll take my turn, yeah. but I'm not going to be the only one <laughs> doing it. It's a really interesting that some of those smaller things and that stereotyping, um, it's interesting that you're still working to break that down when we thought we might have already broken it down, but clearly not. So we have to keep working and calling it out, don't we? Yep, talk to me about, can you talk to me about what your leadership powers and gifts are? What do you think are your greatest leadership powers and gifts at this stage of your life? Sure. So, yeah, it's a tough one. Hey, and um, if I have to answer that, authentically um yeah. i would say perhaps my leadership power is my ability to connect with people mm -hmm. um the ability to to listen even when people are not speaking you know mm -hmm. um i have for example i'll just give an example i have a senior project manager uh in the organization and we've just put her on that role mm -hmm. Uh, but she was working as a coordinator before with the same people she now has to lead. And I can tell it's difficult for her. And I can tell it's difficult for her because of where, where things come from. Mm. So if I'm getting the register from her, I know that the register isn't coming from my administrator. But why isn't it coming from my administrator? But she hasn't said she has a problem delegating. But I can see mm. that she does because I'm listening. I'm listening to what she's saying. Mm. I'm listening to mm. what she's doing. And for me, that's an important thing to do, to, to, to also just understand because I'm listening, to say to her, um, to normalize and not make someone necessarily feel like, you know, they've done the worst thing possible, even if they have, you just normalize. This is the reason why this is happening is because you're not delegating and we can help mm. you delegate, you know? So I think for me, that's a, that's a superpower, um, but also the ability to, to, I think I have, I think I'm able to communicate really complex topics and really complex mm -hmm. stuff um, in very lay uh, terms so that mm -hmm. more people can understand. Yeah. 
we've done that with with me and with our audience today um, <laughs> as you walk through your research you know because not all of us are in the in-depth space that you are we all come from different backgrounds and you've done that so that's a tr I think that's the truth I'm sure along the way so far you've faced some of the challenges of life what do you do to recover or work your way to work your way through and recover from these sure you know I um I am a person who I think always wanted to be in control all the time and I kept getting challenges thrown at me um and I would spend so much time fixating on the existence of the problem you mm -hmm. know and how the problem affects me and how I can fix it and how why the problem is happening to me etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. and what I learned over the years is that I always get out it doesn't it has not mattered mm -hmm. how big the problem was I have always gotten out of the problem but over and above that I have always been able to even without knowing use the skills that helped me to get out of the previous challenge in the next challenge or to mm. mitigate the next challenge so I have become really um my view of challenges has become really different now now challenges are opportunities to conquer the next um <laughs> and that's and that's how I look at challenges now I'm just like because I know that I have a toolkit that will get me out. And sometimes that toolkit isn't me. Sometimes the toolkit is someone else. So sometimes mm. the, the toolkit involves me picking up the phone and saying, I want this and I want that, you know? So being able to, um, it's it's taught me so much about uh, the value of networks. It's taught me so much about, these challenges have taught me so much as well about the value of delegating, um, not, not thinking. Cause you know, when you're younger as well, you want to be the star unnecessary yes. you know it's so unnecessary mm -hmm. to be the person who's who's doing all of the things because mm -hmm. perhaps other people can do some of the things so they can learn um to do things and I can do some of the things that perhaps other people at this stage are unable to do where my vision and mission of the organization is mm -hmm. concerned you know so so that's now how I look at challenges and and I think that's how I I, mm -hmm. I tackle them yeah they're there too um what does it make us a better person or a stronger person and give us the skill to to continue to meet them because life will throw them at us when we least mm -hmm. expect it. Mm -hmm. If you had a message for women today of any age to how they get more confident and claim that space to get a louder voice and to get a voice that's listened to, what would what would be the one thing you would say to them today? This is a very interesting question. I like and to keep was, my interesting hard questions for the end, you see. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very interesting question because I mean if if I if I was asked this question perhaps four or five years ago, I'd say stand in front of the mirror and you know, um learn how to layer your words, you know, spend a lot of time accumulating mm -hmm. the knowledge you're required to be able to answer and speak on a whim because really what makes people nervous about speaking is thinking that they're going to say the wrong thing or someone will ask them a question and then they won't be able to answer. So then you spend a lot more time not speaking and accumulating knowledge, you know? So, mm. so I would have answered this question very differently, but of late, I, I have come to realize that there, there are people who are skilled at, at, at talking verbally. And there are people who are skilled mm. at talking in their actions and I mm. think as women we need to figure out which ones we are that's the first thing and the second thing is to say that what is important as well is to understand why you want to be heard I mean a lot of people want to be heard everyone wants to be heard uh, mm. but why do we want to be heard where do we want to be heard for what then when we can mm. answer that question and, and, and the answer to the question you're asking isn't there isn't a one answer because we're such different personalities as women. And I think mm. in the appreciation of how different we are and, and where our strengths and our weaknesses lie as mm. women, sometimes I'm able to speak very loudly through someone else, mm. you know? Uh, and it's, it's about knowing 
it's about knowing your strength and knowing why you are speaking at this time. Is this the right audience that you're supposed to be speaking to? Is it going to resonate with that audience? Because sometimes we just always want to speak, but yeah. may not be the right people for the audience, you know? So I think it's, I, I'm going to answer the question by saying, getting closer and closer to understanding ourselves as women is going to lead us so much closer to being, to having the most loud and the most yeah. confident voices as individuals and as a collective as well. That's about the self-awareness, isn't it? Being really, really clear about, and what we stand for, maybe, and the legacy we want to leave as well. Sure. So as we get closer to the end of our conversation today, Tulile, what's next? What do you think's next for you? If you had to just dream a bit or knowing you as I'm getting to know you, you probably have the plans already. But what do you <laughs> think is next? What do you think is next for you where you can achieve that next uplift or growth in the power of your voice and your leadership? Yeah, so so next, so 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 we we have this framework uh, that we've created at at uh, at Ngatuto Edu Propeller, and now we need to almost I don't know academify mm -hmm. the framework. We need it to mm -hmm. be a standard framework that people who are marginalized from everywhere, who are limited in resources, can use to solve problems, um, and we need to. Uh, continue developing a, a a blueprint for assisting people who are marginalized to prototype and build ideas so they can believe that they can. Uh, and when they believe that they can, they will. Um, and that's important. Uh, but we need to grow the organization. Um, and, and in growing the organization, we need to grow the pockets of excellence that exist already in the world that are untapped because the excellence is there. It's just untapped. So we want to um, grow that impact. Um, what am I, 35, 36 now? Uh, perhaps settle down, perhaps make babies. I don't know. Um, you know. <laughs> it's also that. So you, can have, so you can have your own next generation um, to influence and to be a legacy that you leave. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So yeah. There's so much so much for you to look forward to in terms of the next piece the next five years even you know sometimes I think it's hard to look beyond five years because that seems an awfully long time doesn't it um even yeah. five years is a long time and after and after COVID five years it seems like uh you know something that we need to review in terms and of <laughs> I, yeah I often say to teachers you've got to remember that the little people who've just entered school at age five or six they're going to graduate high school in 2036, approximately. So, you know, we're educating young people for a world that we can't even imagine what 2036 looks like. I'll be very old by the time we get there. So I'm hoping that the world's a much better place. And people like you, Tulile, are the people that make our world a much better place by the work that you're doing with young people. And in particular, make your own country a better place for all of you because there are so many challenges, aren't there, in your country? And um, the piece you're working on with education and awareness, and of course your amazing research in the field, um, in the medical world, um, has got to contribute as you progress in that space. So what's a thought, your closing thought for us today? Sure, my closing thought for uh, the remarkable women um, that tune in, um, I think my last thought is just um, I'm I'm really really big on um, self awareness these days. I'm really big on um, giving ourselves a break um, and not being too harsh on ourselves. Um, and really, even in situations where we want to wear a masculine persona, uh, to choose a feminine persona because we don't see a lot of feminine leadership feminine approaches to leading um and i think we need to be a little bit more kinder to ourselves and as women and and, and choose to be ourselves and choose to lead with femininity and choose to be loud and feminine and look feminine you know if we want to of course um but i think just for us as women to to be the truest versions 
of ourselves and try mm. to not allow external factors and external situations to alter who we are in our core, you know, and our core purpose in life to not be altered because, you know, some man was rude. It shouldn't mm. affect how I interact with other people. I should still be able to interact with people with love and kindness and be hopeful, even though someone trampled on me, you know, so the truest version of ourselves, that would be for me, my last, um, my parting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Tilly. What a wonderful conversation. I, while it's quite late for me in my country here in Australia at the moment, um, it's a wonderful conversation. All I can say to you is thank you. Um, you in, you inspire me and you will inspire anyone, everyone who's listening to us today. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity of time and, and thought into the conversation with me today. And can I wish you the most amazing success in whatever you, with what you're doing and what you choose to do next, whether it's growing your organisation, whether it's having a louder voice in your country, whether it's making babies, whether it's <laughs> what it, what it is, whatever it is that you choose to do. Go well, go safely, and enjoy everything you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed that quite a lot. Thank you.